one final comment. I was trying to recall exactly how um, Lou uh, and I met, and uh, uh, he reminded me that it was through an article that I wrote for Sport Aviation on electric airplanes. The particular one was uh, called Bravo, which is an ultralight. And uh, uh, I had flown all the way to Oshkosh and back in 2018. So in the middle of the pandemic in 2020, they invited me to, to uh, uh, invited themselves to come and visit and took many photographs and looked at a flight demo and uh, that's how that article was written. And it was, uh, I'm really glad the article was written for many reasons, uh, primarily uh, meeting Lou. It was uh, uh -huh. uh, a nice way to uh, uh, begin a, a lasting relationship. And Lou is now a member of our Friends of Fish Fission subgroup that uh, uh, meets uh, twice a month on Tuesday mornings to see what we can do to enhance uh, the use of nuclear energy. So uh, that's those are my comments of introduction. Lou, I'll let you get started with giving us a few more details about your background and get right into your talk. And thank you in advance for offering to do this uh, a provocative and I think very interesting topic. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I've been involved with Plato. I've given him two other talks prior to this one. Um, and uh, look forward to this. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody for joining today. Um, whether you're, oh, my background, um, I was a high school science teacher, you know, for 18 years and I took a sabbatical to uh, Argonne National Lab. I lived down on the south side, not where I live today. And uh, and I, I was at Argonne in the education department for about 28 years, and I really enjoyed it. So I, I may plug Argonne here or there, and there's a video that I hopefully distributed. I think there's some links that should be in the hand, uh, chat or hands up section somewhere, uh, several, uh, four links that would be very useful if you could grab them. Um, so, I retired in 2018, so that's over five years ago, and, <laughs> and I was lucky to latch on to Plato and Richard and the Friends of Fission group, and I really enjoy interacting with them and all of you. So here we go. We're going to get started. Um, whether you have an EV or whether you are thinking about an electric vehicle or you just want to find out a little bit more information, Hopefully we'll answer a lot of those issues. What you see in the pictures on this first screen is my Bolt. It's a Bolt EUV. I bought it in March of this year. So I have some experience with EVs. Uh, anyway, we're gonna move on. And the first thing I wanted to do was like a back of the envelope comparison between um, ICE vehicles and so I'm going to refer to them as ICE Vs sometimes, and then electric vehicles. And one of the first things I, I could calculate pretty accurately, you know, the fuel that it to drill, transport, refine, and do all that. It's like six pounds, a little over, of CO2 generation per gallon. And then it, when you actually combust it in the engine, it comes out to 20. So if we add those two together over a lifetime, and this is my estimate of 8,300 gallons. It could be higher actually. So you get something like a lifetime of this, uh, which is a pretty high number. I don't know how relevant that is unless you compare it to something else. Um, but then I tried to do that with the EV and I came up with lithium carbonate. The Tesla uses about this much. It's gotta be refined and that refinement generates uh, CO2, blah, blah, blah. And, but what else does the battery need? And then what uh, charging the battery? I mean, some places have cleaner grids than others. How do, how do we figure that out? So I kind of gave up. I gave up with this. I needed more information. So Richard got me in contact with this book and this author. 
and he was a, a, a good launch point for me. It's an easy read book. It's only 185 pages long. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I, I'm not going to go through chapter by chapter. I'm picking out things out of this book and leaving other things if you want to read it for you to find. Okay. But it, this, this paperback just got released this year. So it's pretty recent. Um, all right. So on page 143 of the book, I find out that not only is lithium needed in, in uh, an NCA battery, which is a typical Tesla battery, um, but all these other things are in there. So how would that possibly do a back of the envelope? I can't. That's impossible. So if you add up all of these masses, you get 213. Then you add this one in, you get... 370 kilograms. That's a really small battery. Most batteries are bigger than that. And then some are bigger than this. Um, but if you look at the percent of lithium, it's under 2%. And a lot of other things like nickel and graphite are much higher in, in this battery. So I, I had to do some, I had to find some other way to come up with a comparison between EVs and ICE vehicles uh, in terms of, you know, emissions, things like that. So here's my talking point for today, okay? A lot on lithium-ion batteries, the types, the chemistries, a bit on the supply chain of materials, not so much, a little on the supply chains, and a, a bit on the recycling and the future. I don't have the future up here. I'm going to talk about electric vehicles that are 100% electric, um, and then compare EVs and ICE fees. And we're, I've sent out a online calculator tool that does emission reductions for the EV. And as this number gets bigger, that's a, good, that's a measure of emission reduction. Because what you're doing is comparing to a gas-powered vehicle what it would have to get to equal the EV. And these typically get into 120, sometimes higher, much higher MPG equivalents. Um, then the cost savings when you fill up or totally recharge the battery, um, there's a tool for that. And these are all easy things to use. The, the last thing, a little bit on climate justice and impacts on indigenous communities. This is the same old story of the haves and the have-nots. The haves reap the benefits of a beautiful car that, like a Tesla or Ionic 6, and, and but the, the have-nots end up eating the pollution and losing their water and losing this and losing that and getting toxic materials. Um, so there is that. I'm not going to go into the detail on that. That is in the book. The charge book goes much more into that. All right, here we go. So here's the first question. Here's the first question. Regardless of how much they might cost, which type of vehicle would you rather own? And this is a survey from July, just a few months ago. And of course, overwhelmingly, well, this chart, 46% say gas, and then we go down the line, and only 19% say a fully electric vehicle. And it really drops off with plug-in hybrids, okay? That's interesting. But fear not, I'm going to show you the next slide. And this is Norway. It's Europe. It's Northern Europe. Um, but Nor 10 years ago, Norway had the same sales as we have today or last year, uh, around 6% or so, somewhere in that ballpark. But look at what happened to Norway over the last 10 years. They created policies and things that really pushed the EV to 80%. They're probably way up here right now, near 90, if not higher. So they there's a tipping point. And I'm reading all over in Google News, oh, the EVs aren't selling, they're not selling. But guess what? At some point, we're going to hit a tipping point, and they're going to sell. That's my prediction. Um, so here we go. Why do I think that way? Well, there are a lot of benefits and advantages of EVs. First of all, far less complexity. 
only 1% of the moving parts of an high-speed drivetrain. No, no emissions, no, no exhaust, no real transmission. Uh, all the torque comes right up front. You don't need a transmission, no cooling system. All that stuff goes away. So when you look at the total vehicle efficiency, you're in this range, at least 90% versus 30% for an ICE V. And that, that's a big difference, a big savings, okay? And when you convert electricity to, you know, the, driving a motor, that's, that's really high, 97%. Then you have regenerative braking, which captures a lot of the energy, not all of it. I don't even know what percent, and it probably varies at the speed you're, you're braking at, but that saves a lot of energy. And then they're very aerodynamic. Look at this car house. It, it just moves through the air very efficiently. It's slippery. Okay, so is a Tesla 3 um, and a high MPG equivalent. So very low cost driving. And one thing, I have a little box here. And my point is if EVs do take off and oil is not in, or refined oil is not in high demand, the prices are still going to go up. I, I bet you they will keep going up, even though EVs should lower the demand. That will continue, I predict. The flexible utilization of interior space, they're very digital. So you get rid of a lot of the screen. Uh, typical uh, dashboard stuff, and you can adjust to that. You don't have to have all, I, the Bolt has both the standard dashboard and the, the, the digital, which makes it easy to adjust, but you can adjust to just all digital. It's not that difficult. And this last point, quiet and quick, and quick is such a joy to slide into traffic and get ahead of the person that you're trying to get in front of. Um, it just, it, they're, they're just, it's a joy to be able to shoehorn into the traffic pattern. It's, it's wonderful. And then these last few points, of course, you, you already know all this, a natural fit into an all electric world and where that's where we want to go, all electric. And they're both beautiful and aesthetically appealing. These cars are gorgeous. A Chinese manufacturer called BYD, Build Your Own Dreams. I'll show you some pictures of their cars. Beautiful, low cost, um, but they're not going to be here for maybe a long time uh, because of China. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We're going to move on to the next slide. And uh, here we're approaching parity. And there, you might say, well, why am I posting something about electronic chip processing and memory, and then battery capacity for cell phones, laptops, and uh, power tools. Why would I do that? Well, they're all connected. All these three are really connected in a way. Um, Moore's law, if you recall, the number of transistors uh, on a chip will do double every two years or maybe even every 18 months. That's, that was his thing. Um, and it's happened. I mean, uh, battery capacity started going up with the lithium ion battery. That's not mentioned here, but, and then it really changed dramatically um, from these last 16 year, the 16 year period, incrementally, not, not as a major breakthrough, but just little changes over and over again made this performance really great. Um, much greater energy density, run times for like power tools, lower recharge times. And then this is remarkable. <laughs> I, I love this co comparison, a tenfold reduction in cost between 2010 and 2020, while lithium carbonate went up at least threefold within the same time period. How does that work? They're counter current to each other. And, you know, part of it is just incremental tweaks, better manufacturing, all kinds of things kept adding and adding to make this happen. And it's really uh, catapulted the end of the EV sales. Um, and 
quality of the vehicle and everything else. Um, so I want to go back in the next slide to these two and try to make a little bit of a connection. So here, there was a 29 year period. The fastest computer in 1991 to a smartphone in 2020, and the iPhone came in around right here on the timeline. Um, the smartphone has far more processing power than the fastest computer there. So it's a 29 year period. And when you look at the smartphone, all these changes, these are percents of, you know, so the energy needed, the weight, the, the cost and all that. So if you really want to convert it to a decimal, you, you, it would, you'd have to add two zeros in between here, which the, this was a huge change uh, in the digital uh, world. It, it just made things work so much better, faster, cheaper, everything. Now, here's the comparison I want to make, okay? A Honda Accord, if it changed at the same rate that so the smartphone did compared to this computer, this is what would happen. This is out of the book, by the way. I, I didn't make this up. The top speed of 1,200 miles per hour, 23 million miles per gallon, and it would cost just a dollar. That's what Turner claims, um, the author of Charged. Okay, so that's just a comparison. So if, if we go back here, and I can't, the reason all of this went so well is the battery came in and supported all of this increase. And the two really were synergistic. They, they just, and that carried over into the car thing as well just because cars are very digital now the evs are all very all models of cars are but especially the d uh, the evs all right i'm going to have to slide through these slides real quick again because i can't um pull out and go back in um here's a brief timeline a little history i'm going to go through this rather quickly in Chicago in 1997, I went to the auto show and the first time I saw a Toyota Prius hybrid. And I was impressed. Oh, yeah, this is a cool idea. Okay. It had a 1.3 kilowatt hour battery, which by today's standards is tiny. Or the most, like a Tesla S has a 100 kilowatt hour battery. And it wasn't lithium ion. This is a very stable battery. And you got all the stuff in bold is pure EV range. This this is uh, with the engine. Um, and so this battery just helped the engine. It, it provided regenerative braking. It, it just helped the overall MPG of the vehicle. Um, then a few years later, the EV1 came out. Um, and it had a lead acid battery. It went to the nickel metal hydride it gave it a little more range um these were only leased they were never sold and and gm could not make a profit off of them so they kiboshed it who killed the electric car well they did because they couldn't make money and they but then six years later musk comes out with the tesla roadster with a lithium ion and he took these batteries out of a of a laptop. These were all laptop batteries. And he took them out or something on that order. And look at the miles. It went way up and the MPG equivalent way up. Um, and by the way, these are cylindrical batteries, very similar to a double A. This is the diameter and this, the first two digits are the diameter. The second two are the height of the battery or the length, whatever. And so he was using those, um, I'm not sure what. Then a few years later, then the, the Volt, which is a hybrid came out and it had some advantages um, as a plug-in. Then the Leaf came out right after that. Still not very good. I know people who bought Leafs and uh, in the winter, they could not <laughs> make a round trip to their job because they didn't have enough range. 
in the winter. They were not good. And then this last line, I remember the January issue of Motor Trend. I, I was getting that magazine. What was on the cover but the Tesla S, the car of the year for Motor Trend that year. And look at why. I mean, it was a beautiful car. And what I've seen uh, just over the week, a uh, weekend ago, someone bought a 2015 Tesla S used. And uh, it looks just like the day it came out of the showroom. It's just gorgeous. Um, so that's a little rundown history of, of the timeline. And speaking of Tesla, Look at the sales. This is the first six months of this year. Tesla has outsold all other manufacturers and more in the first six months of this year. Um, I'm kind of bragging up Tesla, but when you start looking at numbers and things, it's hard not to. Um, and look at the top, the top four or five models. You know, the top two are Tesla, but then you have the Bolt, all versions of the Bolt, not just mine. And then you have Volkswagen ID4, then you have Ford Mustang. Um, so these were the top four, but they really lag behind the Y and the, e, the three. Um, the, the issue with the rest of these is most of the rest of these, not the Lightning, not the F-150 Lightning, but they don't have the 750 rebate. They don't, because they didn't qualify. And I'll get to that a little bit of that later. No 750 rebate, and that really hurts. Um, I'm not sure all the Teslas will have that next year. They may not. Um, so you just have to watch it. But I think all GM and all Ford will have it. Um, that's 750. They'll keep it, uh, to my knowledge. All right. So that that's just a quick rundown of sales. Um, and yet they're only three or may only like 7%. We'll know at the end of the year what the percentage is for all EV sales, but they're running around that. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the history of the lithium ion battery. And that's kind of interesting. Um, this is some time ago. Started with Stanley Whittingham is the middle guy. Um, and he, uh, he was hired by Exxon to build the battery of all things, a big oil company. But, um, you know, and he came up with this concept of intercalation of lithium, which simply means you're going to have a, a layer of a, some type of metal, uh, could be an oxide, could be a sulfide, could be something. And then in bet between these layers is the lithium. The lithium moves in and out. Okay, that was what intercalation of lithium is. Um, so it, it kind of allowed that holding, temporary holding of lithium. And then you had John Goodenough. That's a crazy name, Goodenough, <laughs> but that's his name. Um, this guy, uh, and, and then finally, Akira Yashino from Japan. And um, these, these outer guys are really the ones that put the battery on the map. All of three of these gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2019. And this gentleman, good enough, was 97 years old at the time. He just died this year. And uh, I think the other two are still alive. But So anyway, um, what did the battery look like? I'm just going to run this down quickly. Whittingham um, had a cathode, which was titanium disulfide, it doesn't, layers of that, and then the lithium would fit in between. And then he had an anode that was pure metallic lithium. And then he created the separators and electrolyte. So some a lot of this part of the battery stayed, but the problem with his battery was the anode. It would catch on fire. It was pure lithium metal. It was a problem. It wasn't stable. And it didn't have a very high voltage either. Then good enough from Oxford, England, he did his research there. He came up with a cobalt oxide layers and then the lithium in between. And he did he changed the anode, but I could never find out what he used. 
and it's not that important because this battery doubled the voltage. It was much more, much better battery, kept everything else. Okay. And then Akira Yoshino did create a really good anode, okay, a graphite anode, which has pretty much stayed in place. And um, from this point on, we have the lithium ion battery. Sometimes it's called the LC. LCO or lithium cobalt battery or whatever, but the, it, it, it was born right here. And um, just going to move on a second. Um, so just to talk about how this worked briefly, here's, a, here's these shelves of cobalt oxide, shelves in the here, and the lithium is held in between. And wherever the electron, when the battery is fully charged, all the lithium and the electrons that it has are here. But when it discharges, the electrons move to the load. Um, actually, it's the fields that carry the energy. But um, and then they they bump down over here, and then the lithium wants to go where the electrons go. So when you discharge it, uh, the lithium goes this way through the separator. And then when you want to recharge it, you have to put a current in, get rid of this load and drive the electrons back. And then the lithium will go back the other way. So basically that's charging the battery. There's more higher energy over here, lesser energy over here. That should make sense, I hope. Um, so that's kind of the, the gist of this battery. It's pretty basic. But what, what happened that really changed things is they found out that nickel provided a much sturdier cal, uh, cathode shelving system. So all those shelves of cobalt oxide, somehow the nickel just made them sturdier. And what happened is all of the lithium moved over to the cathode and it doubled the energy density of the battery. Before, only a part of the, maybe half the lithium or less could move. Now all of it could move because that shelving system could hold it. So now when we find out we have nickel cobalt in, in these batteries that are here, they're called the nickel cobalt aluminum, but they all have lithium, nickel cobalt manganese that, so if you use either nickel or manganese, you can support those shelves and you have a really great battery in a lot of ways. Discharges really well, provides a lot of power when you need it, does wonderful things. And those are the batteries that are in EVs right now. One, either this one or this. These are interchangeable, by the way. If it says MC or CM, it's the same battery, okay? But you will never have aluminum and manganese at the same time. That doesn't happen. So moving on, so cathodes become really important. And so this is the basic battery that Yoshino finally uh, put together, uh, good enough, and Yoshino. And um, they went into smartphones, mobile devices. All these things started running really well. and then they made a, another battery with lithium manganese oxide. So there's a lot of oxides. If you go down diagonally, you see all these oxides. And that went into bikes and power tools and things like that. Um, and replaced the nickel cads. The nickel cads were, nickel cadmium batteries were not good. You know, they had memories. If you didn't totally discharge them, they had a memory and you couldn't fully recharge them ever. So you don't have that problem with any of these batteries. You can charge them at any point and they'll charge to 100%. So then finally we get into the nickel cobalt batteries, the lithium nickel cobalt. And these are great batteries. And the, the NCA is, we'll find on the next slide, is predominantly Tesla. But um, these are are used in all kinds of things. And a lot of the Bikes now, that, like you see this bike, that platform is 
pulls the battery is probably this battery here, the NMC111. It's probably that one. And um, the, these kind of bikes and the power tools, they're all moving in this direction. Um, so but my Bolt actually has a battery that's sort of in this range. It has a, a 712 battery. Um, or so, yeah, 721, my mistake. Anyway, um, then there's this battery, lithium iron phosphate, which has been used in heavier equipment because it's a heavier battery. It, it needs more cells and it um, has some advantages for heavy equipment because they're not moving from point A to point B that much. They're just, they're, you know, they're in place pretty much. Uh, so this works out well, My, like buses and uh, fleets within the city might use this, but they have no cobalt and no nickel, very little nickel at least. Um, so um, we'll take a look. I want to just get through the slide here, comparing the NCA and the NCM, just glance down the list. Um, that these are the batteries that are in EVs today. Um, and you can see Tesla's got this one with the aluminum and uh, all the other manufacturers have the NCM, although that might be changing. Um, and there's really diff no difference in cost and a little bit difference down here. But they're all good. This picture um, is a Tesla, probably a Tesla S with two motors in the rear axle and probably a motor up here. And this is the where the battery is held. It's in sheath and that becomes part of the chassis. But there within these are all these cells and I'll show you some cells in a moment um, that are packed in there along with tubes and thermal management um, systems and battery management systems that monitor the various batteries, okay? and keep track of what's going on there. Um, so, so this is a, if this is a Tesla S with three motors, it's extremely fast. It's, it'll, it'll blow out a Porsche. It's a very fast car. Um, so the, this lithium iron phosphate battery is in the middle. And Tesla's trying to move to this. So are some other manufacturers, Volvo, because it's cheaper, it it has it probably lasts longer, but it doesn't release the power. It's not quite where like these guys have better range and better power. Okay, so this description, if you look at the cycles, this this number seems a little off. I don't think it's that high. I think it's lower. It's it doesn't seem correct to me, but um. The iron has some advantages in some ways. It's it's not gonna when you recharge it, it's not gonna blow up on you or catch fire. And why look at look at the higher temperature range it has. Sick that's Celsius. So it's you don't need a thermal management system with this battery, not much of one. Okay, you don't. Um so I there's a couple other things I wanted to show here. Um uh, so here, here are the, let's pull all these, this up. Here are the batteries that, it's sort of a timeline. So we know the Roadster and the Tesla S were the first two, then came the X, then came the Y and the three. And we can see which batteries they use. And now the Y is using this one. But uh, what I can't see back here, <laughs> it's being blocked from my view, but that lithium iron phosphate battery can be charged to 100%, whereas these batteries, uh, these uh, cannot. They should be charged to 80%. So when you figure, well, this can go to 100, it doesn't quite have the density, but when you factor all that together, they're not that far off because um, you shouldn't go above, the, I don't know if you know why you shouldn't go above 80% on these batteries, but they get hot and they expand, okay? and you gotta, they gotta be cooled down. That's why you need thermal management while they're charging. Um, some level of that somewhere. 
Um, so anyway, um, and th these are cheaper batteries. You know, the, this last column is going to be cheaper. So I would say if you're on the West Coast or California, yeah, go with the uh, lithium iron phosphate. That's probably fine. But if you're up in Minnesota and Canada, I don't think so. They have problems with cold weather. They don't, they don't um, handle the cold very well and they lose range. They lose efficiency. All right. Enough about those batteries. Um, I don't know if we have, uh, Richard, if there's any questions coming up so far, or if we need a, a bit of a break, I'm sort of moving kind of quickly here. Um, sure. But I do have some more slides, but maybe we need a little bit of a break. <laughs> yeah, to, we have this well, um, six questions here. Um, Alan, makes a comment uh, about 15 minutes ago um, that uh, that's a seven and a half thousand dollar tax credit. Um, not really sure what he's referring to there. Um, let's see. 7,500 instead of 750, I think was. Yeah, 7,500, right? 7, 500, was, right. That was the confusion. Okay, I think. thank you, Lee. Yeah. Did I say that wrong? Yeah, it's 7,500. Yeah, I think you accidentally said it wrong. Yeah, okay. It's it, it's a big chunk, and some uh, manufacturers get half of that, so 3,750 based on sourcing of the battery minerals and things I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little more about that but yeah i'm glad that was corrected but i'm hoping to get that on mine uh come next next year with a tax uh, on the taxes so we'll see it's a tax write-off on the federal level okay that's what it is all right any other questions that um a few comments the EV emissions tool calculator, I think you put up, Lou, uh, it's from the Union of Concerned Scientists. And um, once you get there, you scroll down to https evtool.uscusa.org. So that's a way to get those. Yeah, I'm going to come up. I'm going to be mentioning that okay. in, in a little bit some more okay. uh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's those are okay. I think those are the things you just put up. So we're all set. Okay. Well, we need a little bit of break. I needed one. I'm rattling off quite a bit of stuff here. Um, hey, Lou, I, I had a question yeah, too. Um, sure. Do we know why uh, they never combine um, manganese and aluminum? In I have the no idea. They, okay. You just mentioned no that, and I was. Yeah, they don't. I never really thought about it before. <laughs> And no, uh, there, mu there must be some particular reason, because a lot of times these people, especially for patent reasons, they like to throw a lot of things together. You know, you throw a, in one extra thing and, oh, we got a new patent, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be, but uh, maybe they're, they just um, don't mesh well. I don't know what it is. Uh, aluminum can have a positive three charge and man manganese two or something. I don't know. Manganese I have no idea has why. a few different ones. Yeah, yeah, a few different uh, oxidation yeah. states. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting. I worked with it with sorbents um, at the DOE several years ago. Um, and uh, it, it has a lot of really interesting and useful properties, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, and it is manganese, not magnesium. There's man uh, don't confuse those two because it's MN, yeah. not MG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's man manganese, <laughs> Just so manganese. people all know they're, they're two different right. elements. Exactly. Oh. All right. Well, I'll start in on, on this sort this process here um, with, with, you know, a lot of things have to be mined. Iron ore has to be mined and, and refined. But with battery minerals or metals, the same thing. A lot of these have to be mined in different ways. Some can be extracted in a liquid form uh, under the ground even. There's the Salton Sea, I think, in California that is a big source of that. Um, and uh, so there, this stuff happens, but it's, and then it's gotta be processed and then it's gotta be manufactured. Now, this isn't just referring to batteries though. This is also referring to, uh, 
Oh, no, open to my screen. I'm kind of, there we go. Now okay. we got it. Got it, it refers, now. It refers to all of this stuff, steel, sheet metal, glass. Every one of these things has to go through some level of this processing or some level of these steps. And every step requires energy. And what it, every step will have emissions of CO2 because of the energy. Now, Luke, Luke, yeah. can I read a question, a comment at this point? When I see supposedly uh, knowledgeable articles written by so-called experts comparing ICE vehicles with electric vehicles, they talk on and on about the mining, the processing, the manufacturing, and all the extra components contributing to carbon emissions. And then they totally ignore those negatives to, in dealing with internal combustion engines, which require a combustion engine, a, a cooling system, a transmission system, and all the rest. And, yep. and it seems to me that, that what, why do they do that? It's so obviously one-sided. Yeah, yeah, you can't just, you got to apply it evenly across the board. And my first or second slide when I was trying to do the back of the envelope, I yep. never I never covered any of these for, for the ice bees at all. I was just covering the fuel, you know, and the, the sure. burning of it. Um, but they, they, they lose but you're right, out. you're right. You're totally yeah. right, Richard. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you and they, you gotta, you gotta, you know, keep things even on both sides of the ledger. I, I'm gonna have two sides of the ledger shortly. Um, Good. Um, so, um, but there could be in the processing of battery materials, there could be more CO2 being emitted uh, than what you would have on the ice bee side. But sure. I, I don't know all that information and I'm not sure how that varies from one, one place to another. All right, so um, this I'm gonna see this again in a little bit, but here here's a quick rundown on supply chain. Uh, sourcing and then maybe supply chain the supply chains would be a whole nother uh, several slides to break that out which i'm not going to do but uh, initially lithium started in the, the triangle of south america mostly chile but these three countries and, and 209 which well, that's when the battery started taking off i mean uh, the lithium ion battery uh, but and and then they would use these pools and needed a lot of water to you know dissolve it and then this would evaporate and then they could collect the, the lithium in a somewhat of a dry form. I don't know the total ins and outs of this, but um, that's what this sailor flats are. Um, but then Australia started becoming a big source of lithium, and it's all mechanized, and they don't do any of this stuff in Australia, okay? And China has some, not sure what they do, but so that kind of covers that. Then the nickel really started in Nor Norlisk, Russia, which is Siberia. <laughs> and uh, that, that the reason is we needed nickel and, and for stainless steel. So it was being mined and processed there. And then it spread out, obviously, this has gone down and, and Indonesia and the Philippines, Indonesia has really gone up with nickel. Um, and I just heard that we're finding new sources of this, like Tamarack, Minnesota has, has some really rich nickel deposits on, on underground in Minnesota, but it's on Native American land and they don't, they aren't happy about mining any of it, believe me. Um, and I don't know how big the mine is, but it's very concentrated from what I hear. Um, and then cobalt, the, the main country is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And some of these regions, it was harvested by hand. There were nodules of uh, baseball size and smaller that people would pick up out of the ground and dig, dig their way and find. And that's what this picture is. That's not a good image. Up to 40,000 children were harvesting things like this over a period of time. And then now it's gotten, they're trying to minimize this. 
and it's all mechanical. It's much more mechanical. So it's not uh, driven by, you know, uh, people trying to make subsistence living. Um, and so all of these are part of the cathode, right? All of this is cathode stuff. And this is the anode. And that's pretty much in China. They have some really unique deposits where they get just the right kind of graphite, which is pure carbon. Graphene is a single layer of carbon that has a regular um, uh, structure. And then if you stack layers of that, you can basically get graphite, um, which uh, anyway, so the, the problem is when they harvest it, it gets in the air, people breathe it, it gets in the water, it's not good for the local people. Um, I think they've improved on this quite a bit. They've cleaned it up back in 2016, it says. But what's what's striking is these two are not good because the there's not enough other places uh, in the world where it's being mined and gathered. And uh, you'd like to have spread this out more. It's not good. And in China, will take a lot of the stuff from different countries and and even though they're not mining it on their, in their own country, they'll grab it from other countries and then they'll process it. And 70% of it gets processed by China and South Korea, much less Japan, much less. So the batteries that get minerals this way don't get the rebate. They don't get the $7,500 rebate, maybe zero rebate. And, and these batteries that are processed here, the minerals here, they probably do much, they get the full rebate, probably, because they're trading partners. They're good trading partners, okay? So that's part of this thing. All right. Um, so you could do a lot more with how all these materials move around the globe and get to China and get to South Korea, but I'm not going to do that. We're going to skip it, okay? So back to this slide again. This is real quick. Um, these first three... Yeah, the battery kind of creates some emissions in these first three steps, okay? It's probably a little bit lower with ice bees because, you know, they're not, the battery is just a lead acid battery to start the car, all right? But um, you have to have all of these to get the, the right mix of the rebate or you're not going to get the rebate on the EV, okay? And then from here on out, if if you have a very clean grid, things get much better for the EV. It's it's going to be very green, and this is not. This is going to be should be black. This will just keep generating emissions um, during the operation. Now I'm going to just reflect for a little bit. Oh, we got this one slide here. This is a really really good slide. Um, this is from the Union of Concerned Scientists. This one guy called, first name is David. He's really pretty good. He's he's kept up with um, reporting on all this stuff. And I don't forget his last name. Um, but so the battery, I'm assuming this is not just manufacturing, but it's processing and it's mining. It's all of, all of it. I'm assuming that, but I can't prove it. And... Look at the reduction, 52%. If you compare, you know, these two columns, it goes down by over half. And if you're talking about a truck, it goes down even almost more than half. I mean, talking uh, Lightning, uh, F-150 Lightning or the Rivi Rivian series trucks, they really drop it down. And I, I, I can't explain that. I don't know why the trucks are better than the cars. It's just the gas powered trucks are dirty. They're just not that. There's a lot of improvement that can be made. Okay. So, so this is vehicle operation. And I want to just sort of the next slide, if I can bring it up. There it is. To reflect just a little bit about operations. Uh, so, an ice V gets free heat. I mean, mm -hmm. in the winter time, you get the heat and and once the car engine warms up, you have plenty of heat and it's comfortable, right? But 
there's a penalty for that, and that is low MPG, and you're going to generate high carbon emissions. That's the penalty for getting the free heat, okay? Whereas uh, the EV has already high MPG equivalency and much lower carbon emissions, but there's a penalty for using heat and it will lower your range. And, you know, you gotta be careful how much heat you use. Um, the heat pump on a Tesla will make this better. Uh, other uh, Ionic 6 or Ionic series has heat pumps. They're, by the way, you're gonna, the next topic next week, is Doug Edwards, and he's going to be talking about heat pumps, but they're on EVs, and they do help conserve energy. So you don't lose so much range when you're trying to stay warm. But you, you know, some people are sensitive to temperature, and they don't want to become a cryogenic mannequin. They they're just going to say, "Screw the range, we're just going to heat this car." So they don't want to. They're, they don't want to become this. I was trying to find a mannequin that was driving the car, but I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't find one. But this is what I found instead. Oh, oh, by the way, before we get to this, I, 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 uh, this really applies to the ice fees because all this leftover heat does not get you from point A to point B. It just becomes unuseful, okay? All this leftover heat up here. Yeah, you get free heat, but you know, hey, it's not helping here and it's not helping here. And it's just a graveyard. Uh, so that I just want to, whereas this does not apply to this, the EV side at all, really. Not at all. Anyway, um, so back to the cryogenic mannequin. Um, you know, before. I did find this guy, which is Starman, which is a, this is the, uh, the longest road trip for any Tesla out there. And it's traveling through space. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's Starman, but there's nobody in it. He's a cryogenic mannequin, actually. And there's a, another picture up here of him. So I think he's traveling to the asteroid belt. I think Musk wanted him to go to Mars, but. I think he's not headed that way. All right. So anyway, so you just got to stay warm uh, if you want to preserve your range. Since And the Bolt is not really very good with that. Um, some cars are better because they have heat pumps. Um, but what I have on my Bolt is a heated steering wheel and heated seats. And that really helps. So I don't have to maybe haul out the thermal underwear just yet. You know, so uh, I haven't gone through a winter with my bolt, but I have the heated steering wheel and seats are wonderful. They're great. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to emissions. This is the topic of emissions. And what I, what this map is, is a map of regional transmission organizations or RTOs that were the, how the grids are broken down. And, and ERCOT is sort of an island unto itself. That's the Texas grid. But the rest of these are somewhat interconnectivity. Uh, now look at this next map that came from the Union of, of Concerned Scientists. And this is for the most efficient EVs. And it mimics this map almost perfectly. It's a, almost a perfect, but what, what, I want to get at is this MPG. What does that mean? Well, it's MPG equivalent. And it means when these numbers go up, you have a very high vehicle efficiency coupled with lower regional emissions. And that becomes important in trying to use this calculator, this calculator tool, which I'm not going to bring up because uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, but you can do it on your own. You can do this, and it's kind of fun. What I There's two things with this map, though, that I want to leave you with. First of all, when, when you use this calculator, yeah, plug in your home state, but then find a zip code for California or New York and plug those in as well and see how it changes. 
it's going to change a lot. And um, again, you want the higher MPG that's showing, that's how high a gas vehicle would have to get to equal what you're doing. Okay. Um, now, this seems high considering you have Montana and Idaho in here. I, I can't believe they would raise this level of cl clean air, but I don't know. I don't know where they're getting some of these numbers, but that's a hydro dams. Hydro dams, yeah. Columbia River, they really okay. really clean up there. Yeah, but that's all up here. Okay, okay. The Columbia River is all up in Washington and Oregon, yeah, but it, right? It drains over from Idaho. Got the Snake River coming down. Yeah, but my point is this map isn't granular enough. It That's needs true. it needs to be more, have more resolution because yeah. in northern Illinois we have a lot of fission, which is very clean, and That's we're right. not getting we're not getting credit for it. Well, with some paler green, <laughs> so, you notice you notice uh, up where medicine is, it's darker than you are. Yeah, I know, but because <laughs> you don't have enough fission going and That's other right. things. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Well, well, the the point is make this higher resolution and i think yeah. it will be it will become higher resolution break it up break it down more show the the sure. real uh mpgs where you're at and it'll be better okay that's just a thought sure. okay so don't try to use a calculator try plugging in different zip codes see what you get and okay. here is the savings uh i'm sure Al alan pencock will uh, in his talk in a few weeks, we'll talk about savings. But um, so this is just trying to show a fill up between like the Camry and various EV models. The Bolt is in there and so is the Tesla 3. Um, and if you scroll, when you mouse over a state and you click on it, don't be afraid to scroll way down because you'll see other comparisons. Uh, just be sure to click on where, be sure to click on North Dakota, because that's an interesting one. Uh, and you'll see a real disparity there uh, in North Dakota. I won't give away all the secrets here. But notice how dark this is. This is the price of fuel. So yeah. these states here, if, if you go into these states, they should show a big disparity because the fuel cost is so high. The pump price is so high. Why? I have no idea, but it is. And so, so you've got all these things going and uh, it shows, let's just play with it. It's a lot of fun and it's easy to do. Okay. Um, all right. So the next the, one of the, we're winding up to the end of the line here, almost. We're dealing with uh, spent batteries, all these EV batteries, but they're, they're not building up so fast because they last 12 or 15 years. Uh, although Tesla's repurposing them. and But you can do other things. You can refurbish, recycle. And I want to talk about re repurpose. I, I'm not a big fan of the mega packs that Tesla is trying to put out there, trying to run the grid way, way out here. I, I don't like that. I don't, think they, I, I don't think that's a good use of these batteries. Maybe residential, uh, power wall kind of thing. That that's okay, but I don't like storage with lithium ion. I think that's not utilizing it properly. That's my own opinion. I'd rather see flow batteries. Well, this should be way over to the side. If you're gonna do something with the grid or some e intermediate uh, area with the grid, that, that should be doing flow batteries, not lithium ion. Okay, that's my two cents for that. Refurbish, there, this was in, Turner talked about this in his book, uh, the chart book that you can target cathode nanode regions, recondition their uh, crystalline electrochemical structure and then add a little lithium. Redwood Materials is doing this, uh, they're refurbishing, but they're also doing all these other things. Uh, they're, I think they're in the East Coast somewhere. And I think they got a big loan or something from the federal government, like $2 billion. But, you know, just to digress a little, so we give a company like this $2 billion and people will squawk about that. But we give um, the DOD and the Department of Defense way bigger 
amounts of money than that over things that don't always work out. And nobody squawks about that, you know. So we should be doing stuff like this and helping these companies out a little bit, I think. And here's another consortium of companies, all with different expertises, uh, different, and they're working together to deconstruct, refine, and remanufacture lithium-ion batteries. And and the order of this is goes in a different order. I, I think it starts with three and then it goes, it, so I'm not gonna read all this, but they're going after the main elements that we want to recycle and then put back into a new battery. I want to save it. Okay. Um, there's a big plant going in Battle Creek, Michigan. BASF has one. Ford has one in nearby, I think, as well. And the United Auto Workers, part of their striking was we want to have union people in these plants. We don't want this to be non-union. We want union people in here, okay? And they, they don't want to miss out on on the jobs that are, this stuff will provide. And if the federal government is supporting it, then we want it union. Um, so they're predicting a 25% reduction in carbon, the carbon that would be, if you can recycle. This could go higher. This could go higher than 25%. But this is great that these companies are trying to get together using their individual expertise to create a synergy. They yeah. make this stuff happen. Okay. So uh, I'm down to two more slides and then I'm done. So the what's the future going to be? Well, keep an eye on China, Toyota, especially, and then maybe even Honda. Um, here's some China models, the B. BYD is Build Your Dreams. That's a manufacturer in China, which outsells Tesla in China. It's, it has like 12 different, these are just two of the many models they make. It's like an SUV. It looks like a gas model, but it's an SUV. And this is the only Toyota EV. So these are these are all EVs, but this is the only Toyota one right now. So they're kind of running behind. Um, but these are the standard energy densities. Uh, remember, this is watt hours, not kilowatt hours. Uh, and this, this is the, the range. So what's, what we're, Toyota's, oops, wrong direction here. Toyota's hoping to build up the lithium ion battery to uh, 490 miles. That's really beyond what a gas vehicle or the ICE V would have. Um, they're trying to build that up very quickly. And then they want to go to solid state, um, which even goes way higher. And you have a really high energy density. These are very stable batteries. They they don't you, know, you can charge them all the way up very quickly. They don't burst in the flames. And what you can do if you got this much range and this much density. What you can do is cut the size of the battery if you want um, and cut it down. But they're not quite there yet. The power availability, just like the um, lithium iron phosphate, is somewhat of an issue. Temperature sensitivity, cost, all these have to be worked through. Okay. But one thing, if you, these batteries get to be up in, in this capacity range, you don't have to worry about being cold in the winter. Just you don't have to worry about it at all. You know, it'll be just fine. So there's a short video that shows the difference between lithium ion and lithium solid state. What's really interesting about the solid state is it has no anode, 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 has no anode. And when you recharge it, the anode builds up. And it's pure lithium. Well, this is was the problem with Winningham's battery, the first uh, battery that was developed uh, on this platform. <laughs> pure lithium would break up into flames. Why this doesn't break up into flames, I don't know. But it's pure lithium building up in the anode. But watch this video. It's very short and it's 
very interesting. It's worth your time to see that. So there's, you know, this stuff's going to change and, you know, it's going to change for the better. I think you're going to find EVs getting cheaper in certain cases. You're going to find tipping point tipping very quickly if any of this stuff really starts happening. These are huge ranges, okay? Um, and finally, my last slide is about argon research. Um, I, when I was this program, the Joint Center of Energy Storage Research started in about 2013, about when the Tesla S came out. It started then, and it's been over 10 years long. The goal is to improve vehicle and grid level battery storage, energy storage, whatever. And it's it probably helped lower the cost of batteries across the globe. Um, it has many partners, other we labs, many universities and industrial. A lot of these industrial partners were Asian. Uh, I don't know about Chinese, but they were Asian um, and around the world and has many facilities. I've seen these. It's impressive. You can do a pathology on a fail, failed battery, do the pathology and see what went wrong. All of these, you can small scale manufacturing just to see how that works. So it's really injected a lot of progress, I think, into the lithium ion batteries for EVs. And the last thing it is this recycling, it has a uh, a department called Resell, which recycles batteries, and is is learning how to do that. And um, the scientist who runs that says, "Yeah, you know, we have to figure this out in ten years because that's when these batteries are going to start ending their life cycle. So we we have a ten year time frame to figure all this recycling out. Okay, and then there's a video on this with Tom Skilling." When you open this link, just uh, give it time to work through the advertisement, which takes about 30 seconds. But Skilling is really good in this. By the way, Skilling's retiring. He he was from Wisconsin. And then WGN Chicago got him, and he never left. But he's retiring at the end of February, Tom Skilling is. And then Seth Darling, who's a scientist, I've worked with him several times. He's brilliant. He's a tremendous communicator of any topic you can name. And he's worked on a lot of different things. Uh, but it's worth watching that if you haven't seen it. Um, so this is my last slide. And I can am I, willing I to make, take any other questions. Can I, can I make a quick a couple of quickies? Yeah. Richard, Richard here. Uh, I took that photograph down in the lower right. I want to take credit for that. <laughs> that is a that is a photograph organized through Lee Casper Galvin. She organized a tour. <laughs> of oh wow! This and, one here, wow! And, and fantastic. One of, the, one of our guides said to me, "I could climb up on a on a railing and take a <laughs> you can see us in the left extreme uh, part of that photograph." And we're right guiding, here. yeah, right, right there. Here. Yeah. And, I had no idea when yeah. I grabbed that. Uh -huh. That's, That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh -huh. The other thing is that uh, maybe a coincidence, but you talked about 2013 and the Tesla S. There, there is, I think, a limited number, or there were a limited number of Tesla S's made that year, which had a total free electric recharging, <laughs> not for the owner, but for the life of that car, I are you see. aware of that? No, no yeah. idea. I have a, yeah. a, a, a friend of mine who who uh, designed the electric go that you've heard me talk about. He mm -hmm. um, had a favor and somebody bestowed upon him this uh, free charging uh, Tesla S. He just loves the vehicle because he doesn't have to, uh, he doesn't, have ready cash always available, and he can just uh, go and plug in any Tesla uh, station around the country. The only problem is 
he tends to take a trailer in order to tow these electric planes around and the trailer diminishes his mileage considerably so that he sometimes has a hard time getting to the next Tesla station because of the, the increased yeah. resistance of this trailer. But that's just a couple of little, uh, little side effects. Yeah. 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 yeah, I I think uh, Alan mentioned something about maybe some folks having free charging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, get my video going here. There we go. Uh, I just chime in on that is uh, I recently heard of someone who uh, bought uh, an older Tesla. It's a 2016 and prior. I don't know what the exact cutoff date is on the, on the grandfathered in free charging. The fellow bought an older Tesla S and paid for a new battery pack so that he could get the free charging. Um, and I've also uh, met people, a guy down the block from me had an older S and he just, he didn't drive on long trips. He just uh, commuted to work with his Tesla and he did not have any at home charging. He just went to the supercharger once a week and filled up and that satisfied his commuting needs. Um, wow. I've, all, I, I've also heard of uh, people doing a livery taxi type Uber driving in Teslas for the same reason. They just go and charge up and run around and it's a free fuel for them. Um, I, I, I got a little free fuel yesterday from uh, up in Stoughton, Wisconsin. Uh, I usually get about an hour's worth of free charging up there and I've never paid for charging anywhere away from home. So uh, I'll bug out from here. Right. Before I leave the, this idea of the lithium air battery, well, that was an early coal of argon, and if that, and I've heard that that may actually be close to development. And if it is, it will blow away this uh, density. The energy density will get close to um, a, a kilowatt hour per kilogram. It, it is just a super dense battery, but it had many problems um, in the past. Is that is that battery also called the the super battery or something like that? In the it could be, it could yeah. be. Yeah, it's uh, it actually breathes air yeah. as it charges and discharges. It, it but it had a lot of dendrite formation of uh, of lithium that yeah. was a problem I, and would short circuit out. Um, which is yeah. What's interesting to me is how we can start charging these things at higher kilowatts um, and faster. And the battery seems to hold up. I mean, um, that's what's remarkable how that, and that, that's discussed a little bit in this video too, of uh, that uh, we're, we're charging at up to 350 kilowatts. I mean, that's really high. Um, and, but that, I don't, Walmart has some of these superchargers and, I don't know what they charge at. Does anybody know uh, what kind of power level they're charging at? Um, in, in general, um, most of this charging that you get comes out with, with Tesla at least, comes out about one quarter of the cost of gasoline. Yeah. And uh, so that's, and that's a smaller figure. There, there may be some lower charges. You mentioned the, the uh, a reduced cost, which which everybody thinks of, I find as a as a Tesla owner, not that it matters whether it's Tesla or or, or any other EV, I find it very convenient not to have to go to the gas station. Oh, wow. um, you know, it just um, uh, we think well, it's not very far to the gas station. Just like people who are cigarette smokers, and they always used to have to go down to the restaurant down below and get a pack of cigarettes, and suddenly you you have this no, you can just totally forget about the need for for going to the gas station unless uh, you get your milk there or your cigarettes there because uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a great convenience just to be able to plug in at home. And I don't find any significant uh, increase in my electric bills. I keep track of them because I have solar panels on the roof and I know that it's not all solar that gets into the car, but, but I simply don't notice any difference. I've been keeping track for 11 years and um, yeah. Uh, I noticed the consistent difference when switching from a hybrid to an electric vehicle. 
right. what happens about five five and a half years ago okay. yeah if you you go to north dakota and do that tool for fill up the fill up tool it's it's around one quarter it's yeah. somewhere around one quarter of the cost um that they come up with um uh, but it varies with the area of the country it, anyway um yeah I'm, I'm trying to um let me just see if i can see something here on the chat I see one more new one here I, I'd, I'd like to butt in with a quick comment here before you get into the chat is okay. uh is because this bounces right off what lou was just talking about and you were okay. talking about is i i go to car shows with my bolt and open the hood and get people talking about evs and i get a lot of naysayers and i get a lot of people very enthused i could probably sell cars on the spot if i had one to sell but uh anytime i'm talking ev to anybody for basically their first time ever thinking about it the first words out of their mouth is well what does it do to your electric bill and i always laugh it's it's like the cost comparison of burning gas versus uh using electricity and down in illinois my electricity is damn near free uh because i'm on a wholesale rate and um it's once you lay the numbers on people and you tell them well you're going to spend a hundred dollars a month on gas so i'm going to spend ten dollars a month on electricity to drive the same amount then then their eyes get wide yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it it does get a little reduction in the winter in the winter you have a you don't quite run as efficiently the these EV um, lithium ions work best at 70 degrees or 75 degrees. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I, I, yeah. I, in my bolt, uh, I'll, I'll be bringing this up in my talk in another month, but uh, I exactly get 25 less, 25% less efficiency. I dropped from four miles per kilowatt hour down to three miles per kilowatt hour for using the, okay. the, he the heater. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And keep in mind that those cars uh, have heating and cooling coils, uh, so they keep the batteries in a very narrow temperature range all year round. So, yeah. so your apparent loss during the winter is simply because, you know, you're heating your, your passenger compartment a bunch, and you're also heating that battery pack. But it's not because the batteries change in their efficiency because they're still running under the same conditions that they see all year long. Yeah, yeah. And I, I believe, um, I, I don't have the source to do this, but I believe like in the case of the, the Bolt, that the computer is calculating in all sorts of things when it tells you what range you got. Your, your normal driving technique it figures in the outside air temperature and whether you got increased rolling resistance in your tires and friction in your bearings and and everything else is calculated into that and it's not necessarily uh, uh necessarily less battery capacity uh but right. it, it's it's a number of things so it, it to us people who drive evs it the range changes like day to day uh, so it does he, 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 even with a full charge you mentioned uh interesting with the tires i mean you really need to keep your tires filled up um that helps you know lower rolling resistance and, and people forget that when the cold weather comes and their tires are a eight or or more pounds lower than they should be you just Many look on the side the side of the door and fill them up at minus 38 pounds for uh to be at 38 um every and Tesla's is probably different. Um, but anyway, yeah. that's and they, important. They, they really fuss if you don't fill it up. They keep telling you and reminding you. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every, every little thing makes a difference. Right. Uh, every little. I should, I should say that, that uh, Doug Edwards has kindly offered a bit of information here. Uh, he said fuel price on the West Coast is high, primarily because there is much less refining capacity on the west coast oh wow right on that yeah um, go, uh, governor newsom uh hates those fuel prices he's bad mouth big oil left and right but he can't budget and he can't change it 
Mm -hmm. oh. So, well, he just needs to get out and support his uh, nuclear plants and EVs that go together nicely. Yep. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Appreciate that comment, Doug. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lou. This was a great presentation. I, yeah. I I learned it was kind of like a trip down memory lane, but I also learned some new things too. So I really appreciate the time you spent getting that together because I know it does take a long time. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I you know you pick and you start with one thing and it leads to another, and then you sort of build this over time. And then it, it's I learned a lot too. It's a, I mean, Doug mentioned how he learned a lot about concrete, and and that's what when you make a presentation like this that's what happens you kind of learn a lot on your own and and try to co corroborate things a little bit back and forth and see what happens much appreciated yeah. by all of us lou thank you yeah oh thank you for letting me do it i appreciate it thanks oh a great job yeah. okay. any other comments or thoughts out there um we have uh just to remind you next week is uh as Lou mentioned, um, Doug is talking about the practicality of heat pumps in Wisconsin. I think this is a great topic. Um, I've been, um, I think some major advances have been made. And what's good about Doug's uh, talk, I think it's gonna be based on personal experience. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Appreciate uh, you're offering that talk, Doug, next week. So we look forward to that. Any other, any other thoughts or comments? If not, we'll say so long and, and uh, thanks again to our speakers and attendees. Yes, thank you all for coming. See Everybody you next have week. a, yep, yeah, bye bye. Thanks, Lou. <laughs> You're yep. welcome. Thank you.